and gentlemen, please welcome Asia Society Global Co-Chair Henrietta Four, Dr. David Shambov, George Washington University, and our honored guest, Governor John Huntsman. Thank you, Matt, and thank you all for joining us. As global co-chair of Asia Society, I am delighted to welcome you to this conversation with one of America's leading public servants who has served us ably at home and in Asia, Governor John Huntsman. With our friends here at George Washington University, the Elliott School of International Affairs, and the Seeger Center for Asia Studies, we are looking forward to hearing Governor Huntsman's reflections on China from his experience as ambassador in Beijing and as well on the campaign trail across America. Asia Society is particularly pleased to host this event. It showcases the central importance to the United States of its engagement in Asia. As many of you know, Asia Society is transforming its presence in Washington because we believe that we can do more here to build cooperation between the United States and Asia. We seek to build new patterns of cooperation, and Governor Huntsman's success in fostering diplomatic, trade, and investment ties between the United States and Asian nations is very important, and it reflects the cooperation among all of us. We are looking for new ideas, new ideas that can be shaped by individuals and by governments into a lasting legacy of peace and prosperity for both the American people as well as for the peoples of Asia. Tonight, we are glad you could join us to explore the critical issues in U.S.-China relations. Tomorrow, we will welcome Da Aung San Suu Kyi to receive in person our Asia Society Global Vision Award, which we first presented to her last fall when she was unable to leave Burma. That event is sold out, but I hope you will watch us online at asiasociety.org slash live and follow our live tweets at at Asia Society and at Asia Society DC. It is particularly fitting that we should partner tonight with George Washington University and the Seeger Center, which has been leading the academic study of Asia here in Washington and really around the world since 1991. Through their deep expertise, spanning Northeast, Southeast, and South Asia, the center scholars have been influenced academic and policy debates on the central issues of our time around the world. Our guest of honor tonight is Governor John Huntsman. John Huntsman has served the United States as ambassador to China and Singapore, is currently the chairman of Huntsman Cancer Institute. He was governor of Utah from 2004 to 2009, he has also served as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Trade Development and Commerce for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, as a White House Staff Assistant in the Reagan Administration. He is a former executive of Huntsman Corporation and a former trustee of Asia Society. And John and I have served together in two Bush administrations, and he is a friend. I'm also pleased to welcome our moderator, Dr. David Shambaugh. Dr. Shambaugh has been Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the Elliott School since 1996. He directed the Seeger Center from 1996 to 1998, and since that time has been the founding director of the Elliott School's China Policy Program. Professor Shambaugh has widely published on China's domestic politics, foreign relations, military and security, and the international relations of Asia, having authored or edited 25 books, over 200 articles, book chapters, op-eds, and book reviews. He has just published Tangled Titans, the United States and China, and his newest book is entitled China Goes Global, The Partial Power. It will be published by Oxford University Press in January. It is particularly fitting that Dr. Shambaugh should moderate this discussion as he was in Beijing conducting research during Governor Huntsman's tenure and so not only studied Sino-American relations but also lived in China during this time. So thank you all for coming. 
Dr. Shamba, and Governor Huntsman, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Henrietta, very much for the kind introductions, and Governor, welcome to the campus, the Foggy Bottom campus of George Washington University, and thank we you, at GW are absolutely delighted that you could take the time to come and spend an hour or so with us this evening. And I'd also like to thank the Asia Society for uh, our partnership and co-sponsoring this, this event. It's a great opportunity, one of many, hopefully future, um, such events that we can do together with the new Washington Center of the Asia Society. So, um, Governor or Ambassador, I'm not sure what you like, or I'll just call you Governor or Ambassador. Or, uh, welcome. I called a lot worse of the campaign tree. <laughs> <laughs> We did get to know each other, um, as Henrietta indicated, a couple of years ago in Beijing, where amongst other things, we were neighbors, lived in the same neighborhood. He had a little better lodging, I would say, than we Fulbright scholars did. We'll say we had better security. Than you <laughs> but we'd bump into the Huntsmans and his charming wife, Mary Kay, if at, among other places, at the local grocery store. So yes, the American ambassador and his wife do their own grocery shopping. So anyway, good to see you uh, back in the United States. Um, I'd like uh, to talk this evening or discuss with you four broad areas, John, if we can. Uh, first, we're obviously in the middle of presidential election, uh, so that is uh, one, the first area in which I'd like to talk a little bit about the American political process, not so much the election. We know you've endorsed Governor Romney, so we're not going to uh, ask you uh, to do that, but I do have some questions spurred really by your own candidacy um, that I'd like to ask you first, and then we'll move from that to the subject of public service, if we can. Uh, I think in this audience where we have so many students from the Elliott School and other parts of George Washington, uh, that that would be a useful topic to discuss briefly. And then we'll finally move to issues concerning American foreign policy, both on a kind of global basis, and then towards the end, focus in on Asia and within that China. So that's sort of roadmap, give you a sense, all of you a sense of where, where we're going to go this evening. But if you don't mind, um, and then we'll have time, I should say 15, 20 minutes for audience uh, questions, which I will also moderate. Um, so let's start, um, Governor, if we can, with the American political process. Um, during your campaign, and I, in preparing for this evening, I actually went back and looked at a number of the video clips from New Hampshire and, and post-New Hampshire, I should say. Um, you, you mentioned a number of, of aspects um, about the American political process that I'd like you to maybe discuss again with us a little bit this evening. One is the trust deficit that you see in our country um, and the polarization of politics. I think in one, one speech I heard you give, you used the word duopoly, the duopoly of American uh, politics, the disappearance of the middle. And indeed, it is a subject of great concern, I think, to many Americans, uh, this polarization. Um, so I just wonder if, if maybe we could get started uh, with your views about uh, the changed nature of party politics, and for that matter, even the electoral cycle. Do you have any thoughts about the primary system, the way it's presently configured, um, term limits, I'll let you sort of take that. There's a number of questions there, but you can take that where you like. Thank you, David. And may I say what an honor it is to be here on, on campus, to be here with you. <laughs> it's an intimidating prospect to be with Professor Shambaugh. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of when I was called over to a hotel in Beijing by Dr. Henry Kissinger. And uh, you walk into his room, and he was about to go downstairs and give a speech to a group, and he said, what do you think I should say? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, if this isn't an intimidating moment, I don't know what would be. The man who designed the bilateral relationship wants to know what to say to the group. But it's a pleasure to be with you, David, and with, uh, with Ingrid and your son, Chris, and of course, Mary Kay, uh, my much better half, who I have to blame somewhat for our lackluster performance in the presidential campaign. <laughs> Because she sat me down at the very beginning, at the outset, and she said, we're going to take this journey together. I said, right on. That's how we want to do it. She said, if you pander, and if you sign any of those damn pledges, I will leave you. Good. That, 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 
<laughs> that pretty much disarmed us right from the very yeah. beginning. <laughs> so as you go through uh, a presidential campaign and, and as you kind of prepare for one and think about what it is that needs to be communicated to the American public, we're really down to three deficits that I think every student in this room really does need to reflect upon because it's going to fall to your generation to get it done. And um, the first is a fiscal deficit because when you hit 100% debt to GDP, it becomes more than um, a debt issue. It becomes a national security issue to my mind. And it means that we have a much more difficult time competing in the international marketplace. That's what's coming at all of you students, is unprecedented debt and the need to really begin to take it seriously. And no one is going to be able to do that until such time as we're realistic about entitlements and even the Defense Department. Everything's got to be on the table, and we've just got to get beyond this sort of sacred cow mentality. The second part is the one that really disturbs me. And it's going to fall to students in this room to figure out how to kind of frame it going forward. And it's the second deficit. It isn't the fiscal deficit, but I would argue it's just as corrosive as a fiscal deficit. It's called the trust deficit, David, that you did bring up. And we're not talking about it at the presidential level. I don't know why. But to me, if you don't have fundamental trust in your institutions of power, and if you don't have trust in your elected officials, then it makes it very difficult for your system to function. And when Congress is trading at about 8% approval, I mean, you have to wake up and say, what universe are we living in? Uh, where does this come from? And what is driving it? And having looked at the system and participated in the system, I'm absolutely convinced, and I know this is up for debate, people will disagree with me, but I think the trust deficit will have to be ameliorated mm. by the following. And the sooner we can get there, the better off we're all going to be. Term limits. Mm. Now, you can say all you want about the pros and cons of term limits. I've watched it play out. But I think, David, there's this institution mm. called incumbency. And it reaches up and grabs people, and it grows very deep roots. Mm. And 80% of people always go back. They're reelected time after time. And, and you wonder why there's this thing called crony capitalism that has infected Washington. Number two is the reality that super PACs are destroying politics in America mm. and money in politics. We don't like to talk about it. Nobody really wants to get too specific about it. But it's where we are. And as a nation, we need a real conversation about money in politics and how you finance campaigns. I've been on both sides of it. Listen, take it from me. I've been on both sides of this debate. I had a super PAC. Talked to Colbert about his super PAC yeah. recently at his program. <laughs> if only we had joined forces in South Carolina, we could have brought it home. Uh, and, uh, and I ran for governor with the idea that whatever we could raise at the grassroots level, if we could raise enough, we would be, we would be viable. Number three is we must expand people's access to democracy mm. and participation. So when I was reelected in 2008, I looked at the numbers in our state, in Utah, and was chagrined that the young people had peeled off. They didn't participate as much in that election cycle. And so we thought we'd do a little bit of research, uh, put a little group together, a bipartisan group, and figure out why. And not surprisingly, the young people were of the opinion that the incumbents always get reelected. There's not much that we can do. Our voice doesn't matter anymore in this country. Money always wins out. And you get young people who begin to peel off of our system, we're toast. We don't have a future. That's you. And so I say, a course correction is going to take some simple but very difficult deliverables in this country. Because I believe by doing it, and even beginning a conversation with the American people on it, we boost trust. Mm -hmm. And by boosting trust, we begin to ameliorate the trust mm -hmm. deficit, which perhaps is the most corrosive element in politics today. But we've got to get to a point where we get more people turning out at an earlier level in politics. You know, when you go to the Iowa caucus, and I was against uh, 
subsidies. When you're against subsidies for corn, corn and soy, soybeans, you may as well not show up in, in Iowa, as I uh, uh, came to find. Uh, <laughs> you have a small group of people turn up, not just in Iowa, but in, in many of the early states, a fraction of the voting population who pretty much determine uh, the course of our uh, nation's history. And I say we are too good as people. And this nation projects too important of an image and values that change history when we can stand up and all be counted for as part of our electoral and democratic process. And when so few people turn out and determine our future, it's just not right. We can change that part. So these are all aspects of mm -hmm. what I would uh, term to be our second deficit, which is, which is a trust deficit. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's hard to talk about it. These are all big issues that have to be led by somebody kind of at the presidential level at some point, but they're all part of fixing and healing this country of ours. Mm -hmm. And number three, just quickly, I think we suffer from a confidence deficit mm -hmm. in this country. So when I was in Beijing sitting with the Commerce Minister of China, a man named Chun Deming, smart, well-educated, exposed to the West, like a lot of ministers in China these mm -hmm. days, they're good. They know their, they know their brief. He pulled me aside after a discussion on trade policy. We had a round of trade negotiations up coming. And he said, Ambassador, let me just have a word with you. He said, don't let your people in America lose their confidence. Mm -hmm. Because when you lose your confidence, the rest of the world feels it and is affected by it. And I thought, this is a surreal moment mm -hmm. for the United States ambassador serving in China country I think is pretty remarkable. Being spoken to by the Commerce Minister in China about confidence and about American confidence and what price the world pays when we lose our confidence. We're down, but these things are cyclical. We'll get back on our feet and we'll get moving forward. But I mention that because I don't want a student in this auditorium to feel that where we might be in certain aspects of political life or social life are locked in for good because they're not. We go in cycles. We have down periods just like people do and we pull out. And it will be up to the ingenuity and the resilience and the engagement of your generation to get in, to look at things a little differently than we have in the past and actually bring about change. Now, when I was sitting in your seat years and years ago, I used to hear that same lecture, never thinking that you'd ever be on a stage or ever be in a position to change anything. But your day will come. And you'll, because of this education you're receiving, because of the networks that you're, that you're making for yourselves here in the States and even internationally, you'll be in a position to do something about where we are. Don't let us down. That's a, a perfect segue uh, to the next question I wanted to pose concerning public service. But uh, before we move to that, um, let me just ask you one question about Iowa, since you raised it. If you're going to show up in Iowa, uh, I think one needs to show up with Randy Travis in tow. Um, or at least uh, you made some interesting uh, reflections upon why you didn't uh, go into Iowa. And if one does go in, what one has to have, including a really statewide, county by county, uh, network uh, uh, to, to get forward. But the question I'd like to pose has to do not so much with Iowa, but the front-loaded primary system in this country. I mean, within two or three primaries, it's over. If you don't win in those first two or three or four, this year it went a little bit further, actually. Um, and back four years ago, it did as well. But do you have any thoughts about the, uh, the staggered nature of our primary system and how that might be reformed? I don't know there's a whole lot that we can do about the scheduling of, of primaries. Mm -hmm. I think there's something we can do about turnout. And I think there's something we can do about blowing the lid out of exclusionary, mm -hmm. limited uh, caucuses and, and political events. Mm -hmm. So I come from a state, a great state, uh, Utah. I grew up in California, lived in Utah, served uh, twice elected governor there. They have a convention which only, I think, two states in America still have. 
And so you're elected as a delegate in the mass meetings in springtime mm -hmm. to show up a couple of months later for a convention at which you may have 2,500 or so people turn out who basically determine who the next leaders will be for your state. And I say there's something that lacks broad-based participation in mm -hmm. this model. It may have worked early on, but today's issues and debates require full-blown turnout and participation, and there is a movement afoot to move more toward open primaries, which I think is a very, very good thing for this country. Open primaries that start as early as possible, mm -hmm. I think would be a very powerful mm -hmm. thing for this country and rejuvenating our mm -hmm. democracy. Okay. Well, let's, let's then move uh, to the question of public service, because there are, as I say, so many of our own students, including my own students, uh, in the audience this evening, a lot of whom are aspiring to uh, enter one form or another of public service. Uh, the Elliott School at GW, but indeed other professional schools here, um, have contributed a great deal, a great number of, of people over the years. Um, you, if I may say, are an exemplar of someone who has contributed to public service throughout your life. Um, you've served in all branches of, almost all branches of government served in the Reagan, both Bush and Obama administrations. Uh, you've been Deputy U.S. Uh, Trade Representative, Deputy Secretary of Commerce, elected governor of Utah twice, where at one point he had, I think, 90% approval ratings. You only get those in China. Um, <laughs> and that's considered low in China. If you have 90%, you're, you're in trouble. That, that litany to Mary Kay sitting over there would suggest that I'm perfectly unemployable. <laughs> um, and indeed, you've served as ambassador uh, to Singapore, the youngest American ambassador ever, 32 years old he was when he went to Singapore and then, and then China most recently. So you have personally a, a very a varied and very distinguished uh, career of public service yourself. You have two sons right now uh, at the U.S. Naval Academy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, and your, the, the motto, or the slogan, if you will, for your campaign for president was putting country first. So I thought tonight it would be useful and, and if you would reflect a little bit about the importance, you've already started, but the importance of public service for young people today, and what your own personal experiences in each of these um, positions you've held, going back to the early 70s in the Reagan, Reagan White House, when I think you first went to China, mm -hmm. in fact, how that has made you the uh, public uh, figure that you are today. Well, you're, you're kind, David, to say that, but the fact of the matter is I'm a failed musician. <laughs> and a fallback position for a failed musician, of, of course, is politics. <laughs> and uh, I guess the highlight of the political career, career was being able to play the piano on the David Letterman show yeah. and uh, with Paul Schieffer and the CBS Orchestra. I, saw I decided yeah. to retire at that point because life doesn't get much better than performing uh, there. <laughs> You know, each generation um, delivers realities uh, or is delivered realities about our country. Uh, the reality for this generation will be that uh, we'll have enormous challenges in the world, some by non-state actors. We don't yet know how to deal with that. It's relatively new. We have less money with which to problem solve. We have less in the way of leverage and throw weight in the international community. Yet we have values that are still the envy of the world. And I think always will be, so long as we keep them burnished. We have a name brand, the United States does in the world. We forget that sometimes. And when you see it overseas from thousands of miles away, you can see whether a Republican or a Democrat serving, you can see the values shine. And you can see them move and inspire people in ways that I can't even describe to you but you'll see it during your careers. Uh, and you'll step out onto the world stage and we'll have to make something of our place in history. And I would ask you this, what is it that you wanna do with your professional years? How do you wanna change the world? What kind of impact do you want to leave? You know, you can put it as simple as this, and this kinda caught me, you know, as governor when I used to have to go around and speak at the funerals of fallen soldiers. Mm -hmm. Because this was right after we went into Iraq. And uh, when you're governor, you're also commander in chief of the National Guard. And we had thousands and thousands of 
uh, guardsmen and women who rotated in and out of Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Someone once asked me one time, David, what was the hardest thing you ever had to do uh, as governor? And I guess they thought the answer was going to be, you know, some major legislative initiative, mm -hmm. tax reform, uh, education reform, whatever. The hardest thing for me as governor was going over to Kabul, Afghanistan for the first time. Must have been 2005 or 2006. And I heard the day that I arrived that one of our National Guardsmen had been shot and killed. <coughs> Second Lieutenant Scott Lundell. Never met him to know who he was, but he was one of ours. And the embassy met us there on the tarmac and said, would you mind going out and speaking at his memorial service tonight mm -hmm. at uh, Camp Phoenix, mm -hmm. which was a forward deployed base outside of Kabul. I said, of course I will. Uh, I'd never met Second Lieutenant Scott Lundell, mm -hmm. but I stood in this auditorium in front of, I don't know, 300 bedraggled, tired, uniformed soldiers who were there to pay honor to this service, service man. Mm -hmm. And I summoned up everything I could to reflect on service mm -hmm. and the importance of service and giving the ultimate sacrifice. And I kind of got through it, it was tough. But then I did something that was even tougher. I took his personal belongings, which he had uh, in, in, in front of the dais where we spoke, mm -hmm. his boots, a satchel of a couple of books, photos of his kids, couple of tokens from the military, and I car carried them home to, to his wife outside of Salt Lake City. That was about the most moving thing I, I ever did. And I flew all the way back from Kabul carrying his personal belongings, got back to Salt Lake, got in a car, and drove out to her neighborhood. And I knocked on her door, and I said, on behalf of a grateful state and a grateful nation, I just want to express condolences on you and your family having paid the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And with that, handed over her husband's personal belongings. It was about the hardest thing I ever mm -hmm. did. I mean, I, I'm kind of an emotional guy, and that was a really tough thing to do. She stood there in her doorway with four kids. And mm -hmm. strong as can be, she looked at me and she said, I know that my husband died doing what he thought was right for America, and because of that, I'll be okay. And I say there's a streak of service that goes through Americans, particularly young Americans, mm. that is extraordinary. And I don't know any other way to define it other than to say that young men and women are willing to give it their all in pursuit of keeping this country strong. And you will be no different when you get out there. But as you prepare to set sail, I would say that you need to determine how you're going to bring about change, how you're going to impact the world in your own right. And that means not becoming a generalist, but becoming an expert in something. So when I have kids come up and say, what do you think I ought to do in life? What do you think I ought to be? I say, what does your heart tell you to do? Because the one true test of planning a career is to conclude that your heart never lies to you. It always will tell you where to go and what to do. And so we've got a lot of smart young people here in this auditorium. And I would say to you, shape your careers around becoming an expert in something really important that is going to leave a lasting legacy. Become an expert in China, in China's military, in China's economy. Drill down deeper than that, you'll be indispensable. There are generalists running around everywhere. Nobody needs a generalist in today's world. We need experts. Mm. We need people who are trained in the nuances, the history, the traditions, the culture of those who we're going to be dealing with during the course of your generation. And then we're all going to have to kind of get our acts together and say, mm. where does the United States go from here? Because we've taken two major body blows in the last few years, David. I don't know any other way to put it. You know, we were hit on 9-11. We weren't expecting it. And I'm convinced that we still haven't figured out what it means. Mm. Emotionally, mm. politically, from a foreign policy standpoint. We're still sorting out, particularly in the aftermath of Iraq. We're trying to make sense out of a lot of decisions that were made in the aftermath, and we're scratching our heads saying, why? 
And then we were hit economically. And people were left literally shipwrecked. And now we're trying to think, what is the next big thing for the United States? Where do we go? Where do we package up the energy of the 310 million people who call this place home? And where do we go? The one thing that will be true during your careers is that the light of our values and our name brand will shine. It's what we do with that. We're no one in the world for democracy, liberty, human rights, free markets. You can argue as a Republican or a Democrat, independent, libertarian, vegetarian, whatever you want. But that's what we're known by in the world. And we're respected. Even though some don't like our policies, we're respected for what it is we stand for. And you all need to take those traditions, burnish them up a little bit, and, and go out and make the world a better place because they're waiting. Oh, very inspiring words, Governor. And you did a great thing for that young lieutenant. Um, I hope our students in the audience have, have listened carefully. Uh, that's a, actually a decision I made 35 years ago on this campus when I was an undergraduate. So I'm, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and that's what we're trying to train uh, in the classroom. That's why I personally devoted my own career to being a teacher and a professor, trying to inspire young people to go uh, in this direction. Um, well, you spoke uh, of foreign policy and the challenges since 9-11. Uh, maybe we can transition to that a little bit. Um, during your campaign, uh, foreign policy played uh, a bit of a role. A, uh, you gave one speech at the University of Southern New Hampshire, I believe, in which you laid out a very comprehensive agenda and vision. I pretty much lived in New Hampshire, David. I, <laughs> <laughs> so much I developed an accent. <laughs> I wasn't even pandering. It just happened organically. <laughs> Not a bad state to spend time in if you have to. Um, Anyway, you, I was quite impressed with that uh, speech and that vision, uh, which I won't repeat. I'll let you tell the audience, if you like, the components of what uh, you thought faced America and the next administration um, and what you would have brought uh, to the White House. But I guess until this past week with the events of, in the Middle East, foreign policy has been AWOL in this election, as it frequently is in our national elections every four years. It, it gets passing mention. I think there's usually one debate that is devoted to foreign policy issues, which is better than no debates. Um, but uh, it's been a non-issue, really, a non-factor non at the conventions. Uh, Senator Kerry gave one speech, I know, at the Democratic Convention. Didn't really appear in Tampa. So I wonder, first of all, what you think about um, the role or the absence of, of international affairs in our national presidential elect debates and, and elections. I mean, this, and, and secondly, to the extent it does come up, it always seems to come up in the context of American leadership, either maintaining American leadership, restoring American leadership. Um, this term, uh, and we hear it on a daily basis again in this electoral cycle. I just wonder if leadership, or how you think about American leadership, and what role the United States should be playing in the world. Is leadership a, the right way to think about the American role in the world today? And if so, what does that mean to you? So there's, again, there's quite a lot there that you can, you can pick up on, but tell us what your thoughts are about foreign policy for the next, whoever wins on November 6th. I think it's, it's horrible that there's no real conversation about foreign policy, because what does a president do once they're in office? Take a look at their daily calendar. Yeah. <laughs> what do they yeah. spend their day doing for the most part? Yet, we don't have any kind of rigorous discussion about the role of the United States in the world, how we begin to prioritize our international interests, and what the expectations are for a new president over uh, the period of an administration. Uh, how we extricate ourselves from wars, mm -hmm. how we uh, expand trade and uh, investment links abroad. It's just not being discussed at all. So I thought in mm -hmm. the campaign, that we would be heavy on policy, so we did lay out mm -hmm. some uh, pretty extensive policy platforms, not only on, on foreign policy, but on defense, national security, on education, on energy, on a few other things. Why? Because it's important for this country to be having a conversation about where we go and what we do, uh, and not just the simple throwaway uh, lines. So 
in our speech, we highlighted just a couple of things that I think are going to be salient during, during your careers. One of them was, in order to have the first, in order to have an effective foreign policy, it kind of helps to be united on the home front. Mm. I don't think you can, you, can, you can express American values when you're as deeply divided as we are today and have the rest of the world pick up on it and respect it. So we have a little cleaning up to do on the home front. Beyond that, I would say that we don't have leverage in our negotiations abroad with an economy that doesn't work. We can no longer stand on a soapbox and try to convince others that the marketplace is the way to go and trade liberalization is, uh, is the pathway if we haven't done it right here. If we have crony capitalism, if we have Wall Street that breaks every now and again because of financial securities that are leveraged up well beyond what any rational economist would say is reasonable. So let's begin this whole exercise with a conversation about how we get it right at home. And when we get it right at home, then we're going to be prepared to begin projecting our influence abroad more effectively than uh, is the case today. Um, Secondly, I think we have a lot of cleaning up in the Middle East to do. So there's talk of the Arab Spring and uh, what all that means. I don't know what it means. I don't know anyone walking the earth today who knows what it means. I do know this. It's going to play out for a long time. And it won't be uh, at least a couple of years before we have some certainty about who the leaders are, what the power structures are, what our long-term linkages ought to be uh, in North Africa and the Middle East. But as it plays out, we need to protect our interests. We know what they are. Uh, we should uh, shine our values uh, on the region and be willing to support those uh, who are reflective of those, of those interests. Fourth, I think we need a big powers uh, focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we need, to, we need to pay real attention to China. I think we need to pay real attention to India because that will be the direction that we go politically and economically. Uh, like it or not, that's just where the world is taking us. And, uh, and finally, I think it would be very helpful to have uh, a neighborhood strategy that really did articulate what to do in our own hemisphere, how we get that right. Uh, how we get the relationship with Mexico and beyond right. There's an immigration component. Uh, there's a, a natural resources component. There's a trade and investment component. There's a cultural component. It's all there. Mm -hmm. And we just haven't worked on it for right. a long time. And I say, if you've got trouble on your doorstep, whether it's immigration or whether it's the drug cartels, uh, you're going to be impacted by it at some level. Let's see if we can't. Uh, develop a policy that would uh, that would address that. But uh, here we are with an election just weeks away, right. and I think a very muddled sense of what we do mm -hmm. in terms of the United States of America, 25% of the world's GDP, the greatest military that's ever been put together, a little loose in the Middle East in terms of mm -hmm. where we're scattered and where we need to be. The greatest universities and colleges on earth. We are still the envy of the world. And we can't seem to formulate a worldview right. that is worthy of our place and time. We can do better. Hmm. Well, uh, speaking of relations with the great powers, woman Shinzai Kei Tanda Mei Guogen Yatai Di Chu Da Hayo Jungo Wanti Ching Kwan Hao Hao. So we went, okay, so um, <laughs> I've noticed in watching the other uh, video clips of Ambassador Huntsman's speeches around the country, he's frequently asked to say something in Chinese, but the person who asks him to say something doesn't know Chinese, so they don't <laughs> ask him. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they would say during the debates, you know, you're broken to Chinese occasionally. Well, what do you expect when you're bored to tears on the stage? You want know, to you want to mix it up a little bit. That's right. <laughs> David, the first thing that comes to mind when you're sitting there on this debate stage, yeah. you know, you look at the colleagues who are taking the journey with you, and you know, it applies to me too. As you say, 
you know, the barriers to entry into this game are pretty damn low. Mm. <laughs> you can elaborate on that if you like, but... <laughs> um, well, that brings us to, it brings us to Asia, um, and uh, we want to give Asia appropriate, appropriate time this evening. Um, first of all, I guess let me ask you a couple broad kind of Asia questions and then a couple of China specific questions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Ambassador Huntsman uh, was ambassador to Singapore during the Bush administration, the first Bush administration, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you've spent quite a lot of your uh, life uh, in Southeast Asia, including the summer. I believe you spent, uh, I know you were in Indonesia for a while in Singapore. Um, so I'd like to ask you a little bit about your, th your thinking about uh, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It's a group of 12, or 10, sorry, 10 uh, Southeast Asian countries that have... I'm sure there are a couple more who would like to join. True. It's an organization that's now 45 years old. Um, it uh, passed a new, or adopted, I should say, a new charter in 2007 when they passed their anniversary. But it strikes me, as I teach International Relations of Asia, that it's still a organization that's really struggling, struggling with its identity, struggling with its decision-making processes, struggling with its um, membership issues, struggling with its place between the great powers, between the U.S. and, and China, um, trying to balance national interests amongst these 10 members. And we're in a period now where you don't have the kind of visionary leaders that ASEAN once had with Lee Kuan Yew and, and Dr. Mahathir and others. Um, at least they're not struggling over Myan the Myanmar issue at the moment, but that also drove a, a real wedge amongst the membership for a long time. So I just am kind of curious, since you're fresh back from the region, um, what your sense of the state of ASEAN is, its future, and its role in American foreign policy. U.S. foreign policy, I think, has frequently been criticized, has always been Northeast Asia heavy and Southeast Asia light. And this administration, I'm pleased to say, but um, even the, the Bush administration previously um, paid some attention to Southeast Asia. This one seems to have tried even harder. But I'd like to get your sense about the role of ASEAN in American Asian uh, policy, broadly speaking, and where you see this group of 10 going. Well, they're maturing. And that may be one of the reasons why they, over time, have mm -hmm. struggles connecting because they're not remaining static, and I think that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, they're evolving. Mm -hmm. They're evolving economically, they're evolving politically. So if the grouping that came together in 1968 for collective security purposes really hasn't been at war. You know, we had Vietnam until 75. We had problems between Vietnam and Cambodia beyond that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the region has been self-contained and peaceful. And I say, if you can get over, you know, half a billion people in a collective economy that's probably our third largest trading partner, uh, to live in some harmony. Mm -hmm. What strikes you about ASEAN is the beauty of its diversity. Mm -hmm. It is truly the crossroads of the subcontinent and broader East Asia. And uh, all pieces of it have come together based on different chapters of history, uh, invasions, wars, trade routes. And it's kind of grown up into, I think, a very solid, a stable and secure grouping of nation states. Burma has been the outlier, Myanmar, uh, and they were always very sensitive on that, and we always kind of had a hard time having that conversation in, in recent years, but now that's kind of become a win. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, as I noticed in making the rounds in some of the ASEAN countries, is a, is a point of pride, mm -hmm. because they all kind of feel some level of Indication. responsibility for bringing out uh, uh, Myanmar. And with Henrietta and the Asia Society, uh, recognizing Aung San Suu Kyi, what a big deal. That's mm -hmm. gonna be a terrific event for you, and I really salute you, Henrietta, on, on what you're doing. But I think because of ASEAN's success, mm -hmm. they sometimes are overlooked. You know, you tend to focus on the hot spots. Right. You, sp 
you focus on those areas that are in need of immediate attention. And all the while, ASEAN has been busy kind of developing, building economies, trading, right. uh, expanding its linkages internationally. And now they're growing up. And I'd have to say that one of the truly bright spots in the world today, as I told a group in Jakarta a while ago, is ASEAN. Now, what are they concerned about? Uh, they they kind of have their act together uh, within the region. Uh, I think there's good harmony, notwithstanding uh, the protocol that was put forward by the Cambodians at the last uh, meeting, which prompted the Indonesian foreign ministry to uh, make a round of visits and calming everybody down. Uh, the system works. Uh, but what's on everyone's mind in, in ASEAN? What's on everyone's mind really are, are three things. One is Europe and their level of exposure to Europe. Mm. So you run the gamut from Singapore, which has a GDP that is 25, 30% financial services driven. They have exposure. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a serious deal. To Indonesia, that is basically saying, we're okay. I think we'll get through this without uh, too much problem. The second issue really is China, and that is how to deal with sovereignty disputes, how to deal with China's overtures to the region, uh, how to deal with really a diverse history that each country in the region has with China when you track the last 50 years. Every one of them, it's a different trajectory, a different history. Uh, good periods, not so good periods. And the third then is the United States and what role the United States will play. Uh, in the region. Why is that important? It's important because most in ASEAN feel that the United States has played a helpful role in keeping the sea lanes open for the free flow of trade and commerce. And the uh, choke point at, in the Straits of Malacca, free from any kind of uh, 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 mischief uh, by outsiders. And they want us there. Uh, when I served in Singapore in the early 90s, we had just been uh, sent out from the Philippines, Mr. Ambassador, and trying to kind of rebuild regionally what our force structure would be. And uh, Command Logistics Western Pacific, which was in Manila until 92, mm -hmm. was then repositioned in Singapore. An altogether new thing for the region, for ASEAN. Uh, you Singaporeans, you're bringing in the Americans. What to do about that? What are we to think? Uh, no, we're not bringing in, uh, we're, we're not an ally formally, we're not uh, hosting troops, right. we're just kind of a logistics refueling center. Well, that has gone from a simple logistics refueling center to something much larger today. And uh, Malaysia is saying, maybe there's a role for us. Right. And Indonesia is saying, well, maybe there's a role for us too. And uh, we've got a great relationship with the Philippines in terms of our own regional exercises and, and cooperation. And so it's all functioning, and now it's up to kind of the United States mm -hmm. to kind of clearly define and articulate mm -hmm. what we want out of the region and how we're willing to kind of pursue things. But my take is tomorrow we should be announcing a free trade agreement with ASEAN. That's, mm -hmm. where, that's where we ought to be. And that's where uh, I think the marketplace should be taking us because of ASEAN's success. I think they're, they're, they're a successful model they're going to continue to grow and expand. You'll always have concerns about the next election around the corner, like in Indonesia. What are the prospects in 2014 when SBY steps down? Megawati Sukarnaputri considering another go at it. Mm. Others uh, kind of in the mix. And you don't want to think anyone is as good as the next election, but there will always be those kinds of concerns. But the big picture is ASEAN has succeeded. Mm. I think beyond anyone's wildest mm -hmm. imagination. And their success speaks for itself, and the United States ought to be engaging in ways that will allow us to grow and expand, starting with the economy and also buttressed by security issues going forward. Indeed, China has a multilateral FTA with ASEAN that came into effect in 2010. And we have uh, just bilateral ones, so very interesting to hear your advocacy of a multilateral one with all 10 members. Um, just staying with the region, then briefly, um, much has been made of the Obama administration's so-called pivot uh, to Asia, the strategic rebalancing, refocusing uh, from the Middle East and Southwest Asia uh, to uh, East and Southeast Asia. 
Um, my question is not so much uh, the wisdom of the pivot. I've heard you speak eloquently about that in other, other places. But my, qu my question has to do with the, um, the future and the ability of the United States to sustain uh, this reorientation uh, with the resources and the vision uh, needed. Um, or do you see this as a kind of one administration flash in the pan that will uh, go by the boards. I ask that because many Asian countries, I travel around the region a lot too, and they all are um, very uh, endorsing of the pivot. Um, they welcome it, particularly in the wake of China's uh, so-called year of assertiveness when we were in Beijing in 2009-10. Um, all, the, all the nations in the region, say perhaps North Korea, uh, welcome it. Um, but they immediately will ask, you know, they question whether the U.S. has the kind of staying power and the resources uh, to sustain this. So my question is, what will it take for the U.S. Uh, to do that? And have you heard similar concerns yourself as you, as you travel around the region? I, I've heard concerns about this very thing from my earliest visits to, uh -huh. to Asia. And I've been going in and out for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always in the back of people's minds that concern about our commitment about uh, our focus, you know, we tend to be, you know, we, as a country, we chase a lot of issues. I'm, I'm not gonna say we suffer from attention deficit disorder as, as others have, but we chase a lot of different issues sometimes and lose focus on the big picture. Mm -hmm. The big picture for this country is uh, the reality that Iraq and Afghanistan are not our future. We've been there, we're still there, we've gotta fix it we got to get out. Our, our future is Asia. Mm -hmm. And whether or not the people of the United States recognize the need to step up to the competitive challenges of the 21st century, that will be economics and that will be education in terms of how well we do as a country. And it will focus on Asia. And I'm convinced that we will be there. Mm -hmm. Our commitment will be in Asia. And it has since at least you know this, David, better than I do, probably 1898. Right. We've been engaged in Asia, and we haven't left, and we haven't throttled down. Uh, and it's gonna take a strategy that allows us to really begin looking at Asia in ways that mm -hmm. my folks, my grandparents, and earlier generations had linkages with Europe. Mm -hmm. And they were taken to Europe by migration patterns, by the economic realities of the cross, uh, transatlantic uh, uh, ties, and by culture. And given the demographic shifts in this country and kids in elementary schools all over America learning Mandarin Chinese, right. it won't be but a few years before we have analogous cultural and sentimental ties across the Pacific. Right. And that will provide the glue, the sustenance necessary to really ensure that these uh, ties are, are, are long lasting. There will need to be a security component as we kind of rebalance or, or shift, mm -hmm. but the Seventh Fleet has always been there, right. and they've always had a commitment to keeping the sea lanes open to the free flow of trade and commerce from which everyone has benefited enormously in the region. And it will take an economic component, which we have yet to fully articulate. You know, we just haven't been active uh, on the economic front. We've underutilized our level, levers of power and influence on the economic side, and we should step up our game enormously. And beyond that, it's a people-to-people -people game right. in the end. <laughs> Policies are only good on paper, and then it's up to people to kind of take them forward and make them a reality. And I'm very encouraged by the younger generation in this country mm -hmm. taking a very keen interest in the region, in China, yep. uh, going back and forth, learning the language, dedicating their lives to somehow uh, serving an aspect of the relationship. All this is very mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. and will be with respect to Asia, where earlier generations are with, with, with Europe, it's just a matter of time. So I'm an optimist yep. on that. Yeah. I'm an optimist. Excellent. Well, I was just going to say, there is a cultural, important cultural dimension to this, too. As you just indicated, both Asians coming this way, as has been the case since the Second World War, but uh, there has been a real spike, in our, in, at least in my classrooms, but I know across many American universities in the last few years, of uh, Asian students from many, many parts of the region. This is uh, really an excellent trend, but more importantly, perhaps, American students going that way. When you were ambassador, you initiated the 100,000 Strong Initiative um, in Shanghai, if 
I recall correctly. I don't think we're quite to the 100,000, but it's a good, good aspiration. So uh, indeed, U.S. Asian cultural exchanges, which the Asia Society has long pioneered, are a crucial component of the pivot um, that I think we should re remind ourselves of. Okay, let's move, if we can, finally to China, and then we'll have time for audience uh, discussion and questions. Uh, we are, we think, on the cusp of the 18th Party Congress. Uh, you know, I haven't announced it yet. Here we are now into late September. Uh, that was one of the periods in which we thought it would be scheduled, October. Uh, the heir apparent just disappeared for two weeks, now reappeared over the weekend um, in still photographs, I might add. We haven't seen him move yet. Uh, so <laughs> so we'll have the, old, the old arts of uh, Pekingology have come back uh, now watching leadership, uh, uh, leadership appearances. But presuming that the Congress takes place in October or this autumn, and presuming that Xi Jinping becomes the new President General Secretary of the party and Chairman of the Central Military Commission of China, um, I wonder if you could give us some insights into this so-called fifth generation of leaders, including uh, Xi himself, uh, from your interactions during your time as ambassador. You've met a number of them, I think. Li Yuanchao, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, what distinguishes, you know, personalities matter in all political systems uh, to some extent, but we don't have a very good feel, I would say, for these new personalities that are going to uh, ascend the stage. So I wonder if you can just give us some sense of uh, those individuals you've interacted with. What, what kind of leader, what sort of typology, what's, what is their leadership style? What can we expect? Well, they've been informed and influenced by more than the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which were really the points of reference for earlier generations. Mm -hmm. We don't want to relive that. We don't want to return. We want to open up. Right. And that's really the Deng Xiaoping legacy. That now comes to an end. I mean, the Deng Dynasty right. now, interestingly enough, ends in October with the rise of Xi because he wasn't anointed by Deng, right. as everyone else has been up to Hu Jintao. And the seven men, in this case, who will populate the Standing Committee of the Politburo, mm -hmm. and then if you round out the 24 or 25 on the Politburo, uh, they're an impressive bunch. <laughs> I try to tell people here in the States. So my first trip to China, although I'd lived in Taiwan in the late 70s, was in the early 80s with Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And you know, the State Planning Commission folks, and the old, yeah. the, the old uh, Chun Yun, and Bo Bo, uh, and Li Shen Lian, uh, in the gray and right. dark suited outfits, no English, no exposure to the West, no attendance of yeah. institutions of higher learning. They didn't have that option. Revolutionaries all. Mm -hmm. And a much different kind of feel when you'd sit down in meetings. Uh, and you go there today, suits, English, sophistication, people who have attended the finest schools in the world, and an understanding of the United States in practically every department that you visit, not just the foreign ministry, mm -hmm. but every department in, 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 with a deep texture, mm -hmm. uh, a, a sense of understanding that I find remarkable. Mm -hmm. Every meeting I'd, I'd leave, I'd think, We've got our work cut out for us. And then you come to visit our departments and agencies here, you try to find anybody yeah. who knows anything about China. It's getting better. <laughs> you go up to Capitol Hill, you try to find anyone who cares about the subject matter, uh, forget, even, forget knowing about the subject matter. And it puts us at a disadvantage when we sit at the negotiating table. And I hope for your generation, you sitting in this room, you correct that because We've got to become expert in the subject matter if we're going to be able to hold our own at the negotiating table. That's the orientation of the mm -hmm. new generation coming up. I'd have to say that one of the most impressive interlocutors I've run across is a man named Wang Qishan, mm -hmm. uh, who will probably be one of the seven, mm -hmm. uh, now uh, a senior vice premier, very well schooled in the art of negotiation, uh, economics and, uh, and big power politics. 
I mean, as you look the world over, and the interesting thing about our world today is it's really devoid of leadership. If you really want to get right down to the bottom line, you try to look for the leaders that you traditionally have seen uh, in years past driving regional initiatives, and I don't see a whole lot of leaders around the world. It's a very strange moment mm. in that we are devoid of leadership. Mm. And in the Chinese lineup, you have some impressive personalities coming forward. And I think they'll be formidable. Mm. I think they're all uh, probably marked by a streak of pragmatism as mm. well. I don't know that you will find a lot of deep orthodoxy uh, in terms of ideological predispositions. I think you will see a group that says, how do we keep the party salient? Right. Because that's the ticket to ride. Uh, and how do we deal in an environment now with slower growth, with 600 million internet users, with 90 million bloggers, with voices we've never had to contend with, with neighbors around us, 14 or 15 nation states, some of whom are uh, experiencing tough times? How do we forge a new relationship with the United States? They're, they're going to be thinking through all of this. Well. Perfect segue, it leads me right to the uh, relationship with the United States and the United States relationship with, with China, which uh, has always been not easy to manage, shall we say, uh, certainly since the early days of the uh, Nick, post-Nixon opening. I mean, the relationship has always had elements of cooperation and competition uh, mixed together, uh, a condition I like to call coopetition. Um, but in recent years, particularly the last two or three years, there is a sense amongst uh, many in the China watching community and those who watch this relationship that the, the balance between those two elements, between the cooperative and the competitive element, have shifted from the former to the latter, from the cooperative to the competitive. And that we, we're seeing in the last two to three years, since that period we lived in Beijing, 2009-10 in particular, a number of frictions and competitive elements, and certainly in the strategic domain, in the Asia-Pacific domain, the pivot is now part of that, in the economic domain, one might even say in the ideological domain, the China model, and so on. So uh, some, and some, some American observers have written that there is pretty deep strategic mistrust, at, and you've experienced it, I know I have, uh, between these two countries. So I guess my question would be, if we now have an increasingly competitive relationship with China, how do we manage that? This is not a Cold War, but it's something that we haven't, uh, as a nation, encountered previously with a major power of this size and nature. So how do we manage the competition, and how do we, exp to use Kissinger's uh, words in his most recent book, how do we expand the zone of cooperation uh, between the two? and bring that balance, shift that balance back to the cooperative side. You know, we didn't have anything to fret or fight over in the early days, right. although we, we were at odds over Vietnam mm -hmm. when Nixon stepped off that Boeing 707 in February of 72, and we'd fought on, on the Korean Peninsula. China lost 400,000 men, including Mao, Mao Zedong's son, mm -hmm. who's buried there. Uh, we need things to do in the relationship. So the U.S.-China relationship works best when we're doing something. Mm. We had the Soviet Union to contend with in the old days. Indeed, that brought us together in ways that were absol absolutely fascinating, even in the intelligence realm, that chapters will be written about in the future. Uh, areas where one would never think we would venture uh, cooperatively. We made it happen. We had something to do that brought our interests together. Now, being involved in China's WTO succession, which a lot of people were responsible for, we had something to do. We were working collaboratively on China's trade liberalization in getting them moving along. Mm -hmm. Today, we're at a very interesting point where we lack the substance mm -hmm. between us, mm -hmm. things that we're doing that are big and bold, mm -hmm. that keep us focused on what together we can do mm -hmm. as and what constitutes our shared interests as opposed to where we, we converge. Right. And to my mind, we need, to fill that, we need to fill that void. And there's plenty we can use to fill, that, to fill that void. So that would be number one. 
we have to be smart enough to know that this is a high-powered relationship. This is a relationship where you've got two countries that want to do things and that are very active uh, on the international stage. In fact, we're the only two countries really on the international platform today. And that makes for a very tricky relationship because we've always had just a bilateral affair all along, which was easier to manage. You just cover the range of bilateral issues and you're done. You have a good, bi you have a good state visit. We're now trying to figure out how to deal in a global environment. It's not a bilateral relationship, it's a global relationship, and it's probably the only such global relationship that we have in the world. Mm -hmm. And that means when you sit down for uh, a bilateral chat, you have to talk about Europe and debt. You have to talk about weaponization in Iran, the Korean Peninsula, the South China Sea, culture, the environment, yeah. everything, because we're both involved. We both <laughs> lead the charge in, in all of those areas. Or if you really want to get something done, it will require the cooperation of the two of us. So let's be smart enough to come up with an agenda that speaks to our, our shared interests as opposed to just our uh, differences. Second, and I used to try to use this line when I go into the foreign ministry, and it, it sounds overly simplistic, but I think it's kind of where we are. We need to humanize the U.S.-China relationship because most people on both sides see it as large, complex, mm. intimidating. Uh, and if you can't get your arms around it, you just sort of pick away at the parts that don't work mm. as opposed to understanding the totality of our interests and where this relationship needs to be. It's a marriage where divorce isn't an option. It, it, it really is. We have to make it, we have to make it work. Right. That's, that's kind of the bottom line. So when Xi Jinping, who will be the next leader, uh, and I'd have to say in, in meetings with him, he's comfortable in his own skin. Mm -hmm. He's confident. You can engage him. And I'd have to say he's probably a masterful politician because he's been able to stay right at the top of the heap for a lot of years. And that means you have to work the PLA, you have to work the Princeling community, you have to work the party. You know, 75 to 80 million members, 3,800 outposts around the country. He's done all that. And there are plenty of opportunities to take him down. Of course, you haven't seen him move in recent weeks. We don't, we don't know. But presumably he's out there. And I'm guessing that they've been talking a lot about the transition over the last couple of weeks. It's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, you get a few hundred of the apparatchiks together, you have to <laughs> fill out the central committee, you got to fill the Politburo, then you have to chop off on the standing committee, mm -hmm. and all that's going to happen. And I told someone on CNN this afternoon on one of the afternoon shows, you know, we think the Middle East is a big story. We think our economic travails is a big story. This in October mm -hmm. is a really big story, mm -hmm. because at the end of this century, when the history books are written, the rise of China and how we dealt with that. Right. Uh, presumably in a way that brought out the best in both countries and therefore the best in the world is going to be the story. Mm -hmm. And that's playing out unbeknownst to a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, music to my ears, you won't get any disagreement from me. <laughs> Ex except Thanks, Professor. there may be a one woman make the standing committee. Remember the name of the Yen Dung. She's an, a sort of dark horse candidate for the top seven. We'll see if that transpires. Have you met her? Yes, I have. Very impressive. My, my betting is for the Politburo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We will see. All right. We have um, about 15 minutes uh, for audience Q&A. What I'm going to do is be very democratic about it and go around the room and sort of take one question from each section uh, first. Uh, I actually, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to call in the first hand I saw, which is this gentleman uh, here on the left with your, with your hand up in the tie. Yep. That's it. So there are microphones. Can you please uh, wait until the microphone? No, no, sorry, behind you, sir. Oh. Um, uh, all the way up. Ah, Eric McVaden. <laughs> are you calling on me, David, yes. or someone else? Please identify yourself, Eric. And uh, I'm Eric McVaden, the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. I hear and read a great deal now about the prospects that the Chinese people may be on the brink of demanding okay. political reform. And have even read that uh, Xi Jinping is considering that that is something that the party must uh, do now. Do you believe these prospects are real? And if so, how should we be thinking about it? I believe this is very real. And I think uh, when we talk about the pragmatic streak that I mentioned earlier, I think Xi Jinping has programmed 
some of these reforms into his next few years. Why? Because there's no choice. The, you know, the, the, the country has reached a 212 degree boiling point and you gotta let a little bit of pressure out of the vessel. And when you consider the conversations that are going around with 600 million internet users and all these bloggers, Mary Kay and I had a dinner for bloggers when we were there recently. And we had 12 bloggers show up, the leading bloggers in the country. And two of them had readerships of 125 million blogs. And the conversations that they were having were such that, you know, anyone having them would have, been land, it would have landed in prison a, a few short years ago. They're having these conversations. I think Xi Jinping, being the pragmatist that he is, and the new members of the standing committee are processing this and probably developing a timeline, now I'm, I'm leaping here, probably developing a timeline that says we have about half a year to a year to consolidate power after October. Xi Jinping will get uh, the party mantle and then he'll get the presidency probably first quarter of 2013 and off to the races. And I believe they're gonna have to strike out on a reform agenda for the legitimacy and survival of the party. And now the party is in the hands of this generation, which is Deng Xiaoping's legacy. His legacy is open doors, open economy, primacy of the party. If you can't protect the party, you're done. Uh, and who knows what happens after that, but protecting the party will require reform. And I believe that part of that reform will be some talk beyond that which they've already done, and they've tried this before unsuccessfully, more democratization within the party. Let's start there. Uh, more in the way of defining a role for the internet in society. Because if you want to be an innovative society in today's world, and they do, you can't innovate without the free flow of information over the internet. You can't just be half in and half out. So I think they're gonna to have to define a role for the internet, which is an extremely important step. And third, the state-owned enterprises are in serious need of uh, uh, addressing. Uh, I mean by the lapels, whether it's procurement practices, intellectual property rights, governance, transparency, buy local, sell local, it's got to be redone. And I think Xi Jinping, given his clout with many members of this community, is in a unique position to begin a reform agenda. I'd say not immediately, but maybe two or three years from now. <laughs> and those are three things <laughs> that I, I'm imagining <laughs> are in the minds of those who are taking over. If they're not addressed, or if a game plan isn't laid out over time, I think you really do hit the 212 degree mark. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna come to the center here, and the gentleman in the front, in the first row. So we need, yeah. Cindy, thank you very much. Uh, Christopher Graves with Ogilvy and Mather, Ogilvy Public Relations. You mentioned, bemoaning the fact that not many on the Hill or maybe even America know much about China now. And yet we have a candidate, Governor Romney, who wants to punish China day one he would take office. We have on Capitol Hill last week the hearings of the cybersecurity issues. There's a lot of fear and resentment today in America towards China's rise, and China calls it a harmonious or peaceful rise. Imagine you were given the job of rebranding China to Americans, its image, what would you do? <laughs> Remember, he worked for Ogilvy. Yeah, it's uh, very specific to your trade, I might add. Uh, but, but let me say you're talking to a failed presidential candidate, so yeah, you have to take it all with a grain of salt. You know, we forget that um, we're exporting more to China than ever before, which is a very powerful thing. We're educating more young people in Mandarin Chinese than ever before. If you want to see a transformation in the mind of somebody, take an alfalfa farmer in Utah. Someone who saw China is a rising threat, hats with a red star in the middle, and as soon as they got that first bale of alfalfa sent over to China, they became a customer. The transformation is complete. This is the reality of our agricultural sector. Who are those who are fighting most the impulse, the impulses to do this gratuitously? The soybean exporters. 
you know, the wheat exporters, yeah. the people who were creating a whole lot of jobs in the agricultural sector to say nothing of other sectors. So what do you do about this relationship writ large? You have to begin to talk about not the fear factor, which is the easy narrative. Any politician can sit in a town hall meeting and fall back on the fear factor and get an applause line. I saw it on the debate stage, for heaven's sake, when I was running for president. I, a couple of these folks were saying, I will declare war on China the day that I'm elected. This big applause line. And, and I try to explain the reality of the relationship. No response. No response. Dead meat. You know, you didn't throw enough red meat out there. Well, I'm not here to throw red meat. I'm just here to tell the truth and to kind of explain. <laughs> But well, we need to go from the fear factor, which anyone can describe, to the opportunity factor. And what does the opportunity factor mean for this country longer term? For the next generation, for our economy, for global stability and security. It's very real, and it then needs to be articulated piece by piece. Uh, you know, you can put a platform together, but it's got to be, le this is where leadership actually matters, uh, where you can go against the narrative, you know, the easy narrative out there. And you can say, but wait a minute, folks, let me tell you what's really going on. And let me tell you what we have to do as a people and as a country to prepare for the next 20 years. And we're going to start seeing an opportunity factor as opposed to just a fear factor. Yes, we have our range of challenges, and we'll have WTO cases, and we'll have human rights cases, and drama will play out every other year, and we'll have the Dalai Lama, who we will meet with because that's part of who we are in standing up for religious tolerance and freedom. But here's a list of things that bring us together as people. And let's not forget that in the end, Americans and Chinese do very well together. You leave us together in a room, and we'll figure out a way to change the world. That's just, that's the way we are. I mean, just on a human to human, heart to heart, head to head level, we do very, very well. Excellent, okay, uh, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce Reynolds, Economics Department, UVA. Governor Huntsman, I'd like to ask you to speculate about why China finds it so difficult to move to an exchange rate mechanism where the market forces basically determine the exchange rate. And could you perhaps uh, use the context of your, your WTO experience? When you shepherded China into the WTO, I think you'd agree the concessions they made when they did that kind of institutional transformation were very considerable, a lot of domestic political pain. And yet now, 10 years later, 12 years later, why can't they marshal that same impetus to do this second step in the institutional reform that's needed to integrate China into the world economy? What's the difference? It's a great set of questions, and to the first part on the exchange rate mechanism or any kind of market-based uh, currency, I think the fear of the global marketplace is what is keeping it uh, artificially valued or uh, lack of any real movement in terms of currency reform. So what do I mean by that? I think they were making good progress in terms of uh, revaluing the renminbi in recent years, so if you can say that it's gone maybe 25 to 30 percent in five years, uh, making good progress, and then the global economy fell flat. And I think there was such concern within certainly Zhou Xiaotuan and the central bank community that we don't have a whole lot of options. It's a fearful, unpredictable world. If we're going to pay the bills and ensure that we can maintain domestic harmony and stability, We've got to keep the export machine rolling along. So just as they were preparing to move toward more a consumption-based model, uh, driving the economy as opposed to investment, uh, the world changed right before their eyes. And I was over there when this was playing out, and there was a sense of real fear. And steps toward liberalization all of a sudden stopped. And we couldn't get them to move. Uh, and I think it was just based on, on uh, on real local concerns about markets drying up, uh, liberalization probably being very tenuous, and for them to hold on to the old way of doing things until the world improved. Goosing your, your, your currency, 
keeping the export machine rolling and maybe delaying a bit of that transition in, into the consumption model. Now we're to the second part of your question. Now we're moving to the fifth generation, Xi Jinping and company. I don't think you can ever underestimate how important these transitions are in the lives of, uh, uh, in the life of, of political China. Uh, and you get about two years out from a transition and all of a sudden things begin to freeze up. Mm. And I would argue that much of what you're talking about in the second part of your question will begin to reemerge uh, under Xi Jinping. You can only go so far uh, and you can argue that Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao did not go far enough in terms of reform. I think uh, there's a very legitimate argument to be made about some wasted years. But now Xi Jinping, once he consolidates power, I think they will be back to the reform effort the exchange, uh, uh, the exchange rate uh, liberalization, and more movement toward a consumption-based model in, in the years ahead, mostly because they have no choice. Uh, they've got an upside-down pyramid that will make it impossible to pay the bills. The math doesn't work, and they've got to move people up the economic ladder, uh, and they've got to somehow move toward more of an innovative job-creating society as opposed to relying simply on exports. A tall order, to be sure, and to get there, I mean, here's the trick. To get there, you have to convince the average citizen that now is the time to take your run mean bee out from under the mattress and invest it in your future, in, in our economy. And the average citizen is saying, well, let's go back at least you know, to the opium wars you know, of 1840 <laughs> and the Taiping Rebellion of 1860 and the boxers in 1900 and the end of the Qing Dynasty in 11 and the rise of the party and the in J Japanese invasion of 37 and 49 and the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and many are saying, I'll keep the run main bee in my mattress, thank you very, <laughs> very much. <laughs> so you, you've got to convince the average citizen that we have built the case for enough stability uh, in where we're going that you can now invest in the long-term prospects of the country. Mm -hmm. And that's where healthcare reform, that's where retirement, affordable housing, all of these are increasingly important to build that sense of confidence. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to disappoint a number of people, I'm afraid, um, because I promised our, our co-sponsors, the Asia Society, that we would end on time. Um, so I would just like to uh, thank you, John, very much for taking the time again to come. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I think we've heard not only a number of, of prescient insights into a broad range of issues we've covered tonight, but my personal takeaway is your optimism. You know, we need, I don't know if it's because you come from west of the Mississippi and the Rocky Mountains, <laughs> um, but that kind of American optimism is refreshing, and we're really pleased to hear it, and thank you again for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.